Hello everyone. So this is the GCSE Science Combined Science Trilogy past paper walkthrough for Biology Paper 1 that was sat in May 2018. I'm going to go through this video and model how I would have tackled it. On the right hand side is a link to the blank past paper and the mark scheme, along with revision videos going through the content question by question. So question number one then. This is about cell structures. Draw one line from each cell structure to the type of cell where the structure is found. So I've got the cell structures, the nucleus, a vacuole and a plasmid, and I've got a prokaryote, a plant cell and a eukaryote. So I should be initially thinking, what are the differences about these for, um, types of cells? Well, I should be thinking the prokaryote is when you've got no nucleus and the eukaryotic is when you've got um, a nucleus and then the plant cells I should be thinking what additional things they have compared to normal animal cells so I'm initially thinking well they've got a cell wall they've got a vacuole and they have chloroplasts those are the three extra things that plant cells have so nucleus then would therefore obviously be a eukaryotic cells a permanent vacuole, well that is one of the three things that a plant cell has, and a plasmid is for a prokaryote. So a plasmid is just a small circle of DNA that floats in the cytoplasm of a prokaryotic cell because they don't have a nucleus. Question 1.2 shows a plant cell. What are the names of structures A, B and C? So I've got this table here and I just need to tick one of the boxes. So I can initially go about thinking and just labelling them A, B and C on the diagram. So A is the big blob in the middle, so that is the vacuole, which contains cell sap. B is pointing to the tiny dots, which is the ribosomes. And then C is pointing to the outer wall, which would be the cell wall. So looking at which row matches that, well, it's the bottom one, vacuole, ribosome, cell wall. A student observed slides of onion cells using a microscope. Figure two shows two of the slides the student observed, slide A and B. The cells on the slides are not clear to see. Describe how the student should adjust the microscope to see the slides on slide A more clearly. So if I'm looking at slide A then, I can see that these cells are quite big, so it is magnified, but it's just a bit blurry. So they just need to focus it. So you would get one mark for simply saying, focus it. You could also go into a bit more detail and say how you could focus it. And you could do that by turning the focusing wheel. Then question 1.4. Describe how the student should adjust the microscope to see the cells on slide B more clearly. Now I can see the big differences here is that it's not magnified very much. I can see loads of cells, although it's in focus on this lens, I can see loads of cells but I can't see them in detail. So effectively what I need is more magnification. So what I need to do then to get a greater magnification is use a different lens. So what you need to do is use a more powerful lens and you can do this by turning the objective lens, objective lenses, to a more powerful one okay so the key thing is you need to say you need to use a more powerful lens for one mark and you've got to say on a microscope you can turn it round to the bigger lens to give you the second mark question 1.5 a student made the necessary adjustments to get a clear image figure 3 shows a student's drawing of one of the cells calculate for magnification of the drawing. And it's told us that the real length of the cell is 280 micrometers. And I can see on the diagram on the cell that it's 112 millimeters. 
So the equation you need for magnification is the size of the image divided by the actual or the real size of the um, object of the uh, specimen. So the key thing though, if I substitute that in, I've got 112 millimeters divided by 280 uh, micrometers. But I can't just do it like this because they're in different units. So I need to convert my millimeters into micrometers. Now, for every millimeter, there is 1,000 micrometers. So one millimeter is equal to 1,000 micrometers. So 112 millimeters is going to be 112,000 micrometers divided by 280 micrometers gives me a magnification of times 400. So you get one mark for substituting it, one mark for converting it and getting to this stage, and then one mark for getting to the final answer. Okay, so question number two. Coronary heart disease is a non-communicable disease. CHD is caused when a fatty material builds up in the coronary arteries. Explain what a non-communicable disease is. Well, a non-communicable disease is one that is not caused by a pathogen. So it's not like the common cold or a virus or a bacteria that is passed from um, person to person through pathogens. It's caused by uh, something just developing wrong or incorrectly inside the body. So it's not caused by a pathogen for one mark and then for, therefore it's not spread from person to person for the second mark. Figure four shows a coronary artery of someone with CHD. Explain how CHD can cause a heart attack. So I can see here I've got the artery walls and I can see here I've got this big buildup of fatty material and I've got to be thinking, how is this fatty material causing a heart attack? Well, what, does, is, what is that fatty material preventing from happening? Well, it's preventing blood from coming through it. So your key things and your key three points to put in would be the fatty material is restricting or preventing blood flow. What does that then mean? Where well, it means less oxygen can then get around the body. And what does that then mean? It means there is less respiration and energy being released in the cells. And if they're totally starved of oxygen, then those cells will die. Question 2.3 then. Explain how lifestyle and medical risk factors increase the chance of developing CHD. So there are two parts to this question then. We've got lifestyle factors and we've got medical risk factors that may increase the chance of developing coronary heart disease. So if we start with lifestyle factors, what things can cause uh, a greater chance of getting heart disease? Well, the obvious ones are smoking and obesity, okay? So if we start off by first of all stating them and then saying what they then cause and how it does it. So if we start off with obesity or poor diet, that leads to a buildup of fatty materials, which then causes coronary heart disease and a high blood pressure. Smoking does something very similar. You get a buildup of fatty deposits, and again, 
that restricts blood flow. which then causes higher blood pressure. You've then got other factors, lifestyle factors, that could affect um, uh, you developing coronary heart disease, like lack of exercise, okay, and high salt intake. Now, if you have a lack of exercise, it means that your uh, body is therefore unable to dislodge or break down uh, any of that fatty deposits. Okay, so lack of exercise means you have weaker heart muscles and therefore uh, fatty deposits are not displaced and then if you have a high salt intake in your diet that can then lead to high blood pressure. So they are four examples of lifestyle factors that can increase the chance of getting coronary heart disease. You don't need all of them um, but they are, they are some of the key ones. Now, if I think about medical risk factors that can also increase the chance of getting coronary heart disease, the ones that I would be thinking of is if you have certain genetic factors, okay, maybe you have a family history of coronary heart disease, that can affect it. Okay, and then another one might be any medications you are on. Okay, so question number three then. This question is about photosynthesis. What is the correct balanced equation for photosynthesis? Well, I know, without even looking at the options so far, that plants need carbon dioxide. They also need water, which makes glucose C6H12O6 and they give off oxygen. So I can look and see if any of these match it. So the first one doesn't because that's reacting, that's taking in oxygen, that's not correct. The next one is again saying oxygen goes in, so it's not that. The third one gives me my uh, correct symbols. So I, let's, I'll put a star next to that just to double check it. Looking at the bottom one, again, oxygen goes in, so it's not that one. So it is the third one, and the correct way of balancing this equation is all of the smaller molecules, you just put a big six in front of them, okay, and that then works and it is balanced. It then says, what type of reaction is photosynthesis? Well, if I'm thinking about a plant and light and energy, it's absorbing the energy for photosynthesis. So it's taking energy in. So therefore it is an endothermic reaction. Photosynthesis is endothermic. Respiration, where energy is released, is an exothermic reaction. A student investigated the effect of light intensity on the rate of photosynthesis. Figure five showed the apparatus used. So you've got your LED light source and you've got your pond weed in your boiling tube surrounded with sodium hydrogen carbonate solution. So this solution is providing the carbon dioxide that the plant needs to photosynthesize. Sodium hydrogen carbonate releases carbon dioxide gas from pondweed. This is the method that they used. They placed the pondweed at five centimeter distance from the light source. They measured the rate of photosynthesis by counting the number of bubbles in one minute. They repeated it at 10 and 20 centimeters from the light source. Question 3.3. Counting the number of bubbles produced in one minute is not an accurate way to measure the rate of photosynthesis. Suggest two ways the method could be improved to measure the rate of photosynthesis more accurately. So it's kind of given us two things in, at the beginning of this question. It's saying counting the number of bubbles is not accurate. 
okay? And it's saying one minute is not accurate. So what could we do instead of counting num the number of bubbles? And what could we do differently instead of doing one minute? Well, you probably at school did an experiment somewhat like this, but a much more accurate way of doing it is getting a beaker and then getting an inverted funnel with a measuring cylinder over the top of it and your pond weed at the bottom. It will then make oxygen bubbles and it will displace the water in the measuring cylinder and the volume of oxygen you get is um, uh, can be used to measure the rate of photosynthesis. So a better way, instead of counting number of bubbles, is actually to trap and measure the volume of oxygen. So trap and measure the volume of oxygen. Now, the second way is saying about one minute. But well, one minute is a very short period of time. You definitely wouldn't be able, if you're doing volume, to get a significant volume of oxygen in one minute. So you could do it over a greater time period. So do it over a longer time period. Question 3.4 then. The LED light source does not get hot. Explain why it is important that the pond weed remains at a constant temperature. Well, if you think in this practical, we are changing the light intensity. Our independent variable is light. So therefore our control variable, one of them has to be temperature. That is why we use an LED bulb because they don't generate heat. So why is it important that it remains at a constant temperature? Well, the first mark, because we know temperature affects the rate of photosynthesis. Because of it, it is one of our control variables and it is, a, um, it is affected by temperature because uh, photosynthesis is controlled by enzymes. Remember again, if enzymes are too cold, they go very slowly. If they're warmer, uh, they then work at their optim best at their optimum temperature. If they get too hot, they would then denature. Question 3.5. Light intensity can be calculated using the inverse square law which is light intensity is inversely proportional to 1 over d squared, where i is light intensity, d is the distance uh, of the pondweed from the light source. The student placed the pondweed at 5, 10 and 20 centimetres from the light source. Explain how light intensity changes as the distance of the pondweed from the light source is doubled emphasis on that word doubled. You must include calculations in your answer. So what this is effectively saying is, as I move my lamp back and the distance is getting bigger, how actually does that affect the light intensity? So it's then saying about it being doubled. So out of these two numbers, I'm just going to use two that double. I'm going to compare five and 10. So and it's saying I've got to use calculations, so I'm going to use this calculation for 5 and 10. So at 5 centimetres, if this is my distance, my light intensity is going to equal 1 over uh, 5 squared. So 1 divided by 25 equals 0 0.04. Then 10 centimetres is going to be 1, the light intensity is going to be 1 over 10 squared, which is 1 over 100, which gives me uh, a value of light intensity of 0 0.01. So, 
In this situation then, at five centimeters, my light intensity is 0.04. At 10 centimeters, it's 0.01. So what's happened to my light intensity as I've doubled the distance, so I've times the distance by two, what's happened to my light intensity? Well, actually, it's reduced by four. It's been divided by four, okay? So the conclusion would be, as distance is doubled, the light intensity is quartered. Or you could just say it is divided by four. Question 3.6. The student's results are shown in table one. You've got the distance from the pond weed uh, in centimetres at 5, 10 and 20, and you've got the number of bubbles produced in one minute, 129, 30 and 8. Predict how many bubbles of gas would be produced in one minute if it was 40 centimetres from the light bulb. So I could add another row to the results table and I've got to predict what this number would be. So if we have kind of have a look at what the pattern is following before, so you've got 129 going down to 31, and 31 going to 8. So what's happening with these numbers? Well, we've just seen the light intensity is quartered, and that's the same thing happening here. 31 goes into 129 roughly four times, 8 goes into 31 roughly approximately four times. So what number would go into 8 four times? Well, it would be 2. So I would say my prediction is 2, okay? It is much lower because low light intensity gives a low rate of photosynthesis. Now I could also say it is one quarter of the previous reading. Okay, question 3.7 then. Describe how the student could change the method to investigate the effect of carbon dioxide concentration on the rate of photosynthesis. I should include how to change the independent variable and say to control variables. So if you think back to that first method um, that we went through, how were they changing or providing the carbon dioxide for the plant? Well, they were using sodium, hydrogen, carbonate indicator or solution, sorry. So the key thing is what is happening, if you have higher concentrations of that solution, that is going to give it more carbon dioxide. So your independent variable could be changed by using higher concentrations of sodium, hydrogen, carbonate. So that is one way we could change the amount of carbon dioxide. If I'm now thinking about my control variables, what needs to be kept the same? Well, now if I'm changing the carbon dioxide, I need to be keeping my light intensity the same. So I could keep my lamp the same distance. So this time I won't be moving my lamp. It will just be kept the same distance each time. And again, I need to make sure this is one control variable that would be constant between them, is temperature. And in order to do that, I would again use an LED light source. Okay, so question number four then. A student have investigated the effect of different concentrations of sugar solution on pieces of carrot. This is the method they used. They weighed the five pieces of carrot, they placed them each into a different tube, they added 20 centimetre cubed of water or one of the sugar solutions shown below, they left them for two hours, they removed the carrot and dried on a paper towel, they re-weighed it 
and they calculated the percentage change in mass for each. So it shows how it was set up and you had water and then you had 0.2 sugar solution, 0.4, 0.6, 0.8. You've got the results shown in the table below, so you can see 0, 0.0 or water went up by 24%, whereas 0 0.8 went down by minus 15. Suggest why the student calculated the percentage change in mass of each carrot. Well, they would have done that because each piece of carrot that they would have cut at the beginning may not have had the exact same starting mass. So you might have a slightly denser piece of carrot in one compared to another. So calculating for percentage change would give you a much more accurate way of doing it. Okay, so suggest the reason why. Well, it is to control or to overcome for the different starting masses. Uh, of, the, of the different pieces of carrot. Question 4.2 then, is then asking us to effectively draw uh, a graph for a table of results in table two. I've just made a quick little copy of the results here, so I don't have to go back. And then I've got, choose a suitable scale and label the y-axis, plot the results, draw a line of best fit. Okay, so it's already given me the x-axis, which are going up in 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8. And I then need to do the percentage change. So what I can do is first of all work out my scale. And they always do tend to give you a very logical scale with the number of squares that it gives you. So I can see I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 squares going up and then 4 squares going below. I know on the positive scale, I've got to get to 25, really. And on the bottom one, I've got to get to negative 15. So what I can do is quite simply uh, far, go up 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and then minus 5, minus 10, minus 15. And I know then I can fit all of these results onto my graph. So that is my scale. And then I need to, and this is the part that people tend to miss, is the label for the y-axis. And this is, if we look back at the results table on the previous page, the percentage change, okay, in percentage. I then have to plot the results. So zero goes up to 24. Okay, so every two squares is representing 1% now. 0 0.2 would be 12. 0 0.4, is 1, 0 0.6 is minus 8, okay, which would just go there, and then 0 0.8 is negative 15. I then need to plot a line of best fit. Obviously, I'd use a ruler for this and um, in an exam paper, but me just doing it on the iPad, I try and just go through. Obviously, that should be a perfect straight line. Now, what this graph is effectively showing then, if it is positive, it's showing that the mass of carrot is going up. If it is negative, it's showing that the mass of carrot is going down. Okay. Now, the point at which this line of best fit crosses zero, zero percentage change, that must be the percentage sugar concentration in the carrot. OK, because at that point where there's no percentage change, you would have a same amount of water going into the carrot as you would coming out of the carrot. OK, so the next question is estimate the concentration of sugar solution inside the carrot cells. Use your graph on figure seven. It's one mark and it's effectively just reading the concentration where it crosses the x axis. So I can see it's about 0.45 on mine, but you obviously would use your line of best fit. And if you did draw a incorrect line of best fit, they would use error carried forward. So question 4.4, explain why the mass of carrot in the 0.6 molar per decimeter cube sugar solution changed. So if I just go back and have a quick look, 0.6, 
gave me a change of negative 8%. So that means my carrot has effectively gone down in mass by 8%. So what has caused that then? <clears throat> well, I could start it off by showing that I have understood that it has gone down. So 0 0.6 uh, mole per decimeter cubed uh, carrot has uh, decreased by 8%. Okay, and this is due to the carrot losing water. And how does it lose water? Well, it's through osmosis. So I'm showing, but I know and I can tell from the results that the mass has gone down. It's decreased and lost water through osmosis and the if you think back to your definition of osmosis, it's always through a partially or a semi-permeable membrane. So remember, a partially or a semi-permeable membrane allows smaller molecules through like water, but the big glucose um, cannot fit through. So I've said it's decreasing, it's losing water through osmosis through a membrane. So that would give me three marks. And then I've just got to explain why the water is moving out. And that is simply because there is a higher concentration of water uh, inside the carrot compared to outside. Because if you think back to the definition of osmosis, it is always the movement of water going from high to low concentration across a membrane. The student repeated the investigation using boiled pieces of carrot. The pieces of carrot did not change mass. Suggest why? Well, if you're boiling the carrot, we've got to think what effect that could have. Well, if you're boiling it, that's going to really damage the cell and specifically damage the cell membrane. So if you damage the cell membranes, water cannot move in or out. Okay, they might have just been totally ruptured open and the cells were all broken apart. So you wouldn't have any movement of water anyway. Okay, so question number five then. Measles is a serious disease. A person can die from measles. Table three shows the number of medically confirmed cases of measles in England between 2012 and 2015. Okay, and you can see the numbers have gone down. Suggest one reason why the actual number of cases of measles in England and Wales may be higher than shown in table three. So although these ones are the recorded ones, why might they actually be higher? It's only a one mark question and it's saying suggest. Well, it may just simply be not every case is recorded or not everyone that has measles goes to the doctors. Question 5.2, calculate the percentage decrease in the number of medically confirmed cases of measles between 2012 and 2015. So in 2012, there are 2,030 cases. In 2015, there were only 91. So what is the percentage change? Now to calculate the percentage change is always the change in the values divided by your starting uh, value times by 100. So 2,030 minus 91, so my change is 1939 divided by my starting one, which is 2030, times that by 100 gives me a percentage change of 95.5 or 90, rounding up 96%. So it's gone down by 96%. Question 5.3. One reason for the decrease in the number of cases of measles is that more children are vaccinated. 
against the disease. Vaccinating a large proportion of the population reduces the spread of the measles virus. Explain why. Well, if you've got a large proportion of people vaccinated, okay, it means that more people are immune and do not get ill. That therefore means there is less chance of an unvaccinated or a non-immune person being exposed to the disease. Question 5.4. Figure 8 shows the concentration of measles in uh, measles antibodies in the blood of a boy. So you've got the amount of measles going uh, antibodies in the blood on the left hand side going up and you've got two different peaks. You've got the vaccine when it was first injected and the amount of antibodies that went up and then decreased and then you've got an exposure to measles, the actual virus, a couple of weeks later. Okay, so Explain the differences between antibody production after the vaccine injection and after the exposure to measles virus. You should include data from figure eight. So we're effectively saying, how, do, how is the immune response different with the vaccination and exposure after you've been vaccinated? So if we go back to the graph and just have a quick look at it, we can see that the speed or the amount of antibodies, sorry, let's start with the amount of antibodies, is much higher after you've been vaccinated, okay? And also the speed at which uh, the antibodies are made is much quicker. You can see it's more of a gentle incline after a vaccination, but it's a very steep incline after the vaccination. So your two key differences that you then need to explain is the speed of the response and then the amount of antibodies. So we know we have to include some data from this. So first of all, let's just pick off some data. I know from reading the graph, that the peak amount of antibodies after being vaccinated is 0.8, whereas after being exposed, the peak antibodies is 7.2. Okay, so I've now got some data which I can use and justify in my answer. So, starting it off then, I could say the amount of antibodies are much higher after vaccination and then I could quote those numbers so it's 0 0.8 after vaccine 7.2 after reinfection okay and then I can also say the speed of the response is much quicker after vaccination. Okay, so if we can now explain why, okay, so this just through these would get us three marks already because we've said the differences between them and we've quoted data. So why do you get a much quicker and a much more effective response is because after you've been vaccinated, you have memory cells, which remember how to make uh, antibodies, which are specific. and can therefore fight that pathogen quicker. 
Okay then, so question six. This question is about stem cells. Give one place in a plant where stem cells are found. Well, stem cells in plants are found in meristems. So stem cells in plants are found in regions called meristems. And meristems are specifically found where plants are growing in the tips of uh, shoots or the tips of roots. Okay, so either of those things, merry stems, tips of shoots or tips of roots would give you the one mark. What is one economic use of plant stem cells? So why do we take stem cells from plants and then grow them over and over again? Economic thinking of money. Well, we don't take stem cells gen to genetically modify them. We would take uh, a different type of cell for that, so it's not that. Creating new species of plants. Well, if we're wanting multiple copies of a plant, we're not going to try and make a new species, and therefore we don't want variation. So why do we use plant stem cells for money? It's because we want to make large amounts of identical plants which have the desired characteristics which then we can sell for more money. Em embryonic stem cells divide by mitosis. Figure 9 represents a cell cycle for a human embryonic cell. You've got stage 1, stage 2 and stage 3. The mass of DNA in the cell at the start of the cell cycle is 6 picograms. A picogram is 10 to the minus 3 nanograms. Convert picograms to grams. So we've got to think about what our units are already. So we should know millimetres is 10 to the minus 3. Micrometres is 10 to the minus 6. Nanometres is 10 to the minus 9. We've now been told that a picogram is 10 to the minus 3 nanograms. So it's minus 3 of a nanometer. So a picogram is 10 to the minus 12. These are the three you need to know. And you've been given information that allows you to work this out. So if I want to convert 6 picograms to grams, I would quite simply do 6 times by 10 to the minus 12, that would be your value in grams, okay? You could write it out with the right number of zeros, but you can just leave it in standard form and that would get you the one mark. The time taken for this cell, uh, the complete cell cycle is 15 hours. Calculate how many hours the cell is spent in mitosis, give it to three significant figures. So I'm going to have to go back to the diagram. So I know this whole cell cycle is 15 hours. And I've been told that mitosis takes up 28 degrees of the circle. And that's the only number I've been given. So if I know mitosis is 28 degrees out of that whole circle, I should remember a bit of math that there are 360 degrees in a, in a circle. So that is effectively my percentage, 28 out of 360. But I want to know how much of it is made in 15 hours. So I can just times that by 15. And that should give me an answer of 1.16 recurring. Okay. So therefore, if I want it to three significant figures, I would round it up okay, to 1.17. Last part then, describe what happens in each of the three stages of the cell cycle, and it's five marks. If I just go back to the diagram, it's stage one, stage two, and stage three. They haven't given us any more information, so this is just simply, you've got to know the main stages and what happens in each stage of the cell cycle. So starting it off then, Stage one, this is what takes up most of the time, and this is what happens before a cell divides. So what happens, it doubles the DNA, 
and or replicates it. It also increases the number of organelles in the cell. Effectively, the cell knows it's going to divide, so it spends a lot of time preparing and making sure that when it splits, the new cells have the correct DNA and they have enough organelles to function. So that is two marks on stage one. Stage two is the mitosis part, which is where the DNA is actually splitting and dividing. So you should remember, as after the DNA replicates, it lines up in the middle of the cell. It's then pulled apart to the different sides of the, of the nucleus. It is then, after it's been pulled apart, the nucleus then divides. So you then end up with two nucleuses with double the amount of DNA. Then, after you've got your DNA and your two nucleuses, this is when your cytoplasm divides. The nucleuses move to each side of the cell and this one can be called cytokinesis, which is the uh, division of the cytoplasm. So you've got more marks, uh, you've got about six points here, you only need five of them, okay? But you need to make sure you are saying something about each stage of the cell cycle. Right, last question then. Question 6.6. .6. Figure 10 shows how embryonic stem cells are produced in therapeutic cloning for use in patients. So we should need to think about what we know about stem cells. Well, they are undifferentiated cells that can turn into any type of cell. And embryonic stem cells are made in embryos. Okay, and these are the more useful ones because they can turn into absolutely any type of tissue. However, you have got the ethical arguments that if you're using embryonic stem cells, you are potentially killing a life. So we've got this diagram here and we've got to come up with two advantages and two disadvantages of using therapeutic cloning. Well, we can see that the egg has been taken, uh, the nucleus has been taken out of an egg. So you've got an empty egg and it's been fused with a nucleus on the patient. That is then turned into an embryo and you can take some of the cells out uh, to be cultured and some of the cells are therefore not used. So advantages of therapeutic cloning then is that you're getting loads of stem cells made. Okay, so the stem cells can be used to treat illnesses or diseases. So that's a key advantage. Another one is that it could be used to produce different organs or tissues that could be used. And because this is what so that I say is your first key advantage. The second one is because you're using DNA from the patient themselves, there is then less chance of re rejection. So there's less chance of rejection because the cells or tissues have the same DNA as the patient. You could also say, and other key advantages might be that there are many different stem cells produced, um, the cells could be used for research and Therefore, if you're, if you're growing your own tissues and cells, then you're not having to wait long time for waiting times uh, for organ donation, transplant lists, etc. OK, but key disadvantages about it, as I mentioned before, is the ethical issues with using embryos it is killing a potential life. Is it right to destroy an embryo when it will eventually um, potentially turn into a person. And the other key issue, which I think is quite key, is that you've got to have donated egg cells. Okay, so there's a lack of donated eggs for this process. 
okay? So they would be my two key disadvantages of therapeutic cloning. But you have got other ones such as um, there are unknown risks uh, of the procedures to the patient because this is a new technique. And also there is a low success rate um, in therapeutic cloning, okay? Because again, it is a new technique. So hopefully that is just summarized the advantages and disadvantages. This is now the end of the paper. I hope this video has been useful. Um, and hopefully uh, if you have any questions or if there are any specific uh, issues with any questions, you can use the revision videos on the right hand side uh, to help you uh, revise effectively for it. Brilliant. Thank you very much.